Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 19 part 3b genetic screening and gene therapy. Now this is under applications of DNA of uh, DNA gel electrophoresis but honestly genetic screening and gene therapy is actually applications of all the three methods we have done so far. So it really also involves PCR, recombinant DNA technology, as well as gel electrophoresis. It also requires other tools and methods which you do not learn in detail, uh, but you do learn a rough idea. Now, genetic screening, in a very simple words, is genetic testing, so testing of a human's DNA in order to find diseases, usually. So this could be for breast cancer, for example, hemophilia, SCA, Huntington's disease, and cystic fibrosis. Whereas gene therapy is the genetic technique used in order to genetically modify the DNA of some cells in the human body in order to cure that disease. And we use vectors, uh, which we'll learn later, to do this. And yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It has its limitations because it's genetic, genetic modification in humans, but has also a lot of potential. Okay, throughout genetic screening and gene therapy, we'll be looking at a lot of social and ethical considerations as well, as parts of it can be quite controversial. So keep that in mind. It is definitely examined material as well. I'm not teaching social and ethical considerations for fun. It is very serious and it comes on an exam. Okay, without further ado, let's start. Okay, what is genetic screening? aka genetic testing. So again, it is the analysis of a person's DNA to check for the presence of a particular allele. Usually, it's a disease allele. DNA is usually obtained from tissue samples such as blood or just a few cells. And this can be carried out on embryo, fetus, newborn adults. There are four in our syllabus that we learn. Number one is pre-implantation genetic um, testing or diagnosis in short PGD, prenatal genetic testing, newborn screening, as well as carrier screening. Okay, we will see a list in, in the next slide. There are also some important examples you have to learn here listed down below. Um, I won't go through each one of them in detail uh, because you have learned many of these examples already. In terms of mutation, you have learned this. Anyways, yeah, so Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's talk about different types. Again, there are four types in your syllabus. Number one is PGD, which is for a newly formed embryo from IVF. So remember in vitro fertilization, um, in, in vitro fertilization, you obtain oocytes from the female and obtain sperm from the male and you mix the oocytes and sperm in vitro, so outside the human body and then you actually test for which embryos are most likely to survive and implant only those embryos. So use embryo transfer and put it in the female. We learn this in the context of frozen zoos um, as well as ways to protect endangered species. But of course, you know that this can be done on humans as well. So yeah, that is a PGD. The second one is prenatal screening, which is for unborn child or fetuses. Um, number three is newborn screening, so genetic screening for newborn babies. And last but not least is carrier screening, which is carrier screening, which is um, for adults as well as kids also can lah, okay? And people who go for this are usually individuals with family history of a genetic condition, for example, or maybe individuals with relatives and family history of cancer. Um, the people who usually go for carrier screening are potential parents as well, people who want to know what diseases are they carrying and what are the risks of passing them on to their child. So yeah. These are the four types. Let's do it in detail. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each type of genetic screening. So let's start with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD. Again, it's, it, it happens um, after embryos develop in vitro and basically you take a cell we'll talk about it later but you do the PGD you pre-select the embryos that you want 
uh, which most probably survives and put it in to the female via embryo transfer. So as I said just now, you remove a cell from the embryo. This is called embryo biopsy. And this is usually at the 8 cell stage at around day 4 or 5. Okay, so fertilized egg would divide right by mitosis, become 2 cells, become 4 cells, and become 8 cells. And at this point, if you remember your AS, the embryo is actually, each cell in the embryo is actually totipotent. So it has the ability to become any cell in the body including its placenta and, and including its placenta and its own amniotic fluid as well. So at this stage, even if you remove one cell, it would not hurt the embryo. Very li like it's not very likely to hurt the embryo at all. So yeah, one cell is enough, just one cell, then that small amount of DNA is amplified using PCR. Great. And then you can use gel electrophoresis and gene probes in order to analyze the DNA. So think of gel electrophoresis, uh, think obtaining this, the, the amplified DNA from PCR, cutting it up with restriction enzymes, doing the gel electrophoresis, and then using gene probes in order to find that specific DNA sequence. Because that specific DNA sequence may just be a faulty allele. And examples of this for the allele right could be for hemophilia it could be for Huntington's disease cystic fibrosis or whatever disease yeah and after that use this method basically to find out which embryo is more suited for implantation uh, usually they take not one but maybe uh, three or four and put them in the womb the rest of the embryos are discarded this is called pre-selection, selecting only the embryos without faulty alleles for implantation. Now, there are several social and ethical implications for this. Or let's start with the advantages first. Uh, first of all, this is great because you can identify whether the embryos from IVF have a genetic condition. And if they do, you don't need to implant them. And your offspring will not have those faulty alleles. And this is great because couples who may be disease carriers um, can now have children with no disease. So maybe without this technology, couples will not want to have kids. But with IVF and PGD and pre-selection, this allows them to have children without disease, without that particular disease. So yeah, this, this could be a good thing for them. Well, obviously, it's kind of controversial because, as I said earlier, um, embryos will be discarded, might be discarded, if not pre-selected for implantation. You can give up the embryos for scientific research, which I'm not sure if is better, or you can freeze the embryo if you want another child, but chances are that they might be destroyed. And this is a bad thing because it might be contrary to beliefs or values. Um, there's a lot of debate at which oh, there's a lot of debate to at which point life starts. So is an embryo, which is like a clump of cells, a life, a living organism? It doesn't even feel pain or doesn't have emotion at that point, or is it not? So yeah, I'll leave that for you to think about. Um, other than that, it could lead to selection based on gender or specific traits because you are testing the embryo before implantation. Other than disease alleles, you actually can check for gender and you can check for specific other traits like maybe eye color or hair color. And this, this may lead, um, if it goes too far, to designer babies so-called designer babies, um, basically you are choosing all the traits for your kid and it's designed by you, by what you want. Whereas in nature, you don't get to do that. So yeah, that is quite controversial as well. And there's not a lot of law surrounding this that much yet. Okay, um, fourth, the fourth thing is, even if the embryo has that mutation, it doesn't mean the genetic disease will develop. So it might be perfectly okay to implant it, but you just don't just in case. So is that right or is that wrong? Like 
that's some food for thought. Okay, so that's the deal with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD. Second one is prenatal screening. Now you don't need to know a lot of details about this, so I didn't list down the procedures here. I just linked you to places. There are two links here. I'll put them in the description box below as well. Okay, um, and these are two methods to obtain tissue samples. Again, prenatal screening is genetic screening for unborn babies, unborn fetus. The first way you can obtain tissue samples is via amniocentesis, and this is using a needle and poking through the mom. It sounds like a big needle, right? And this is to redraw some fetal cells from the amniotic fluid. And usually in the amniotic fluid, there are some cells around and you can, you know, obtain their DNA from there, conduct PCR, and so on and so forth. You can also obtain tissue samples via chorionic villus sampling, which a suction tube is inserted in the mother and put in this chorion, this area here, where the placenta will develop. And this is used to remove fetal cells from there as well for genetic screening. Now, the good things about this is that this helps provide early diagnosis for future uh, futures for fetuses in utero, so fetuses still in the uterus, and therefore, when the baby is born, you can give it early treatment. And this allows the parents to prepare for the birth of a child who may need treatment for a considerable time or even throughout life. This is really true for um, testing whether the child has um, Down syndrome or severe disabilities you know that are genetic based so yeah but in the case of a prenatal screening done very early in the stage of pregnancy so do it early this can also avoid uh, this can also prevent late therapeutic abortions um, and allow women to terminate pregnancy for medical reasons. So in the case where you figure out that the child has a genetic disease um, that may not survive or maybe would cause the mom some problems if detected at a very early stage, this could really eliminate suffering on both sides. But of course, this is very controversial, especially when you think about the um, religion as well as belief systems. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in this video, obviously, but you can definitely read up on it. I think in Malaysia, um, based on a quick Wikipedia search, where is it? Yeah, Wikipedia search here. You can pause this video to read it. But it seems like um, if if you abort a child beyond the fourth child, fourth month of pregnancy, this could be. Uh, this could. This, um, this law states that you could be sentenced up to seven years of prison or fine. Yeah, but um, recently in 2002, it seems that um, Malaysia has allowed abortion up to 120 days, which is around, what, three months, if the mother's life is in danger of fetal impairment. So, yeah, that is... That is legal and abortion on the grounds of rape incest fetal impairment are still illegal so i'm not sure i'm not sure exactly how the law works maybe you can ask your parents who are lawyers perhaps but yeah as you can see it's kind of sensitive and it's kind of hard to decide whether it's technically an advantage or not but according to mark scheme this is an advantage anyways that's prenatal screening. Next, newborn screening and carrier screening. Okay, um, usually when we talk about newborn screening and carrier screening, we are screening for diseases. So hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, you can read yourself. Uh, but one, one example I want to talk about here is breast cancer. So breast cancer is kind of new here. Breast cancer, um, so researchers have determined that breast cancer is hereditary and is caused by faulty alleles of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. These genes are closely linked to breast cancer. Just because you have the faulty alleles of these two genes doesn't mean you get breast cancer 100% though. It just increases the chance, okay? it increases the risk of the person developing breast cancer. 
if if they did carry a screening and the person tested positive for these faulty alleles, um, the person may increase testing to detect cancer early. So maybe go test for cancer every year or so to catch it early. Or maybe even, okay, this is a bit extreme, but there is an option to, for elective mastectomy, so removal of breasts before the occurrence or even the diagnosis of cancer, just to rid, rid themselves of that risk and worry. So yeah, as mentioned, that is an advantage. You can identify carriers, um, you can identify faulty alleles beforehand, and this allows you to be prepared. And if you want to have kids, you can kind of um, gauge whether you can, if you find out both of your carrier, you can decide again whether to not have children or not, or maybe to have children through IVF and PGD instead. Okay, this also helps provide early diagnosis uh, in the sense, in, especially in the case of Huntington's disease as well as cancer, as symptoms only occur later in life, and for cancer, it's kind of hard to tell. And this is great because you can prepare for the future. And if it's present, it enables some lifestyle change or early treatment or regular checkups yearly in the case of cancer. And the idea is preventative treatment is definitely cheaper than treating the disease itself. And yeah, it's just great to be prepared for it. And even if you test and you're negative, okay, if you're positive, you can prepare. If it's negative, it removes the anxiety, oh, I don't have this, phew, I don't need to worry about it anymore. However, there are some disadvantages. The test is too expensive. It is getting cheaper over time, though, um, and more commercially available. So um, you can actually now test your DNA just for fun uh, through this thing called 23andMe. This company provides genetic testing for heritage purposes, disease and it does a lot of things uh, but yeah it's it's even like advertised on instagram but you can see the price here is still usd 99 dollars which is around 400 ringgit it's still quite expensive for a, this is the most basic package test so anyways yeah it's kind of expensive um, many mutations are still unknown as well so even if you test it using 23andMe, for example, it's not a conclusive test. Like, um, they don't test for every single mutation that is possible. That is ridiculous. And we're not sure how a lot of diseases are linked to mutations as well. So it might be useless for most diseases. Yep. And um, for some diseases, when you know you have it, no treatment is possible anyway, so it may lead to anxiety. And even if you have the mutation, it might not develop into disease, so it's anxiety for nothing. How annoying is that? Now, to add on to that, imagine if 23andMe, just a case study, you know, sells all this genetic information to insurance companies, and insurance companies suddenly have the right to refuse you if you tested positive for a certain allele. Wouldn't that be social or financial discrimination? Okay, this is a data and privacy thing. So if you read 23 and Me website, they do have a very strict privacy policy. It's very important in this case, okay? Yeah, um, and I guess lawmakers are kind of, I hope they are kind of thinking about this and crafting more like laws in order to protect us gosh anyways um think of all that uh, but think of this also right if you're a couple and you're married and you decide to have kids um what if you test it and suddenly you don't have kids anymore wouldn't that be a bad thing i don't know actually i think it's not too bad i think i think i have the right to decide whether i have to have kids or not but in the mark scheme this is a disadvantage or maybe uh, you decide to have kids and then you go for the 23 and me test. Would that be too late and cause unnecessary anxiety or additional anxiety on top of the kids you have to handle? So yeah, there are so many factors here and honestly, there is so much nuance. So I'm just going to dump this to you. Think about it yourself, okay? And yeah, um, read about 23 and me even more it's disadvantages and advantages in this link right here by vox great journalistic piece anyways yeah um this 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 kind of advantages and disadvantages thing kind of leads me to this point 
genetic counseling. This is very important. Uh, this used to be in the old syllabus, so not very important in new syllabus, but you'll still see a lot of questions on it. And this is very important actually, even for general knowledge, because there are so many factors to consider when it comes to genetic screening and gene therapy. So it's great to have someone to talk to. Uh, couples are referred to genetic counselors. I think this is in the UK. If both have genetic disease and both are carriers, maybe have a history of miscarriages or something's wrong, or the female is an older woman, especially so because when female um, is older women and they, they want to have kids, uh, there's an increased risk of genetic abnormalities in the child. So yeah, the genetic counselor can run pedigree analysis, look at family trees, schedule genetic screening, explain the results and, you know, coach the person through this genetic screening thing and manage the anxiety, estimate chances of having an affected child in a scientific manner, provide information, discuss and advise on options. Okay, abortion, therapies, financial implications, effect on having affected childs on existing siblings, and other ethical issues, as well as giving them the mental support they need to go through um, difficult, if, yeah, difficult things if the genetic screening results does not come out as desired. So yeah, important to provide a support system here. Yep, so that's genetic screening and genetic counseling. In the case where the person is tested positive for allele, some genetic diseases are treatable by gene therapy. But usually it's to treat serious, common genetic diseases caused by a single faulty recessive allele. I'll tell you why later, and maybe you'll understand as we go along. Okay, again, these diseases that Need, can, can be cured by gene therapy, has to be serious, has to be common, has to be single, caused by a single faulty recessive allele. Cannot be dominant allele, cannot be multiple alleles. A single faulty recessive allele. Okay, why? Because when you have that, you can insert a normal dominant allele and the cell could be able to express that dominant allele and be normal. We use a vector to insert this allele into the individual. Um, this could be a virus, a liposome, or just naked DNA. I will explain that later on. As a result of the process though, the host will have recombinant DNA, and maybe would you call them a GMO? Well, kind of um, not, not really, but they will have recombinant DNA in some cells, not all cells. Now the aim here is to obtain a functional normal polypeptide uh, to reduce symptoms of the disorder and to restore and enhance cellular functions of particular cells only. And, in, and of course, in general, increase the quality of life and survival of that particular patient. Now these are some examples we will go through together. SCID, cystic fibrosis, LCA, which is a genetic eye disease, thalassemia, and hemophilia. You know, actually, we will go through some of this, not all of this. But yeah, enough, enough examples for you to know. Okay, before we go on and talk about gene therapy, which honestly is very exciting to me, it has a lot of potential. But before we do that, I just want to say that genetic editing, gene therapy in gametes and embryos is illegal. Because if you gene edit in gametes, this means you can pass down those corrected genes that's illegal in embryos is illegal as well because that will affect the entire human being we don't want that why well because we don't know the effects it can uh, it, yeah we don't know the effects it will result in it may be detrimental there's not enough research just yet it's currently illegal worldwide however we can do it to somatic cells okay so like I just said, use gene therapy to into effect, uh, put the new dominant allele, which is normal, into affected cells of the individual. So only specific cells of the individual are changed genetically in order to obtain functional normal polypeptide. So can, or we can do it to animal gametes and embryos. This is legal. So make GM animals using these techniques. 
This technique that I'm about to describe also applies to making GM animals. Okay? So yeah. Now we can move on. Okay. Maybe you're still wondering, why is it that the gene therapy only works on single faulty recessive allele? So here's the reverse argument, yeah? So if the faulty allele was dominant, gene therapy is very difficult because even when you insert the normal recessive allele into the human being, it will still be expressed. The dominant one was to be expressed and this means the disease will be still there. To make sure this goes away, okay, if the 40 allele was dominant, to make sure the 40 allele is not there, we need to knock it out, means that's a lingo for remove or replace or delete the 40 allele. And this is extremely difficult because it requires insertion of DNA into this precise location in the genome. Okay, maybe uh, to disrupt the gene or to um, cut out the gene. This requires putting it into a precise location. And this is very difficult. But um, we have a solution now in recent years. And we will cover that at the last video of this chapter. Uh, but just to say, it's not in syllabus, by the way. Okay, we have a solution. I'm teaching it. It's not in syllabus. Okay, that, that's for later. But let's focus, focus on gene therapy as it is in the syllabus, which is on normal recessive alleles. Huntington's disease cannot. Okay. Huntington's disease is caused by 40 autosomal dominant of the Huntington gene, right? So, and it affects many tissues in many, in many parts of the body. Um, genetic therapy only alters genotype of a few target split cells and again only works on single faulty recessive alleles. Here's the procedure. You obtain the normal dominant allele okay, or cDNA from mRNA in cells of a healthy person. Okay, so just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, you can either obtain a, the, the DNA straight or you can obtain mRNA of the gene that is normal from a healthy person and convert it into cDNA using reverse transcriptase and then into double-stranded cDNA using DNA polymerase. You have learned this before in recombinant DNA technology, haven't you? Okay, so yeah, you can take DNA or mRNA from a healthy person, make it into double-stranded cDNA, then Make sure you have the correct allele <laughs> by gene electrophoresis and gene probe. So gene probe finds that specific kind of DNA sequence, which is this normal dominant allele. Use PCR to identify, sorry, to amplify that DNA, which is nominal, normal and dominant. And then make recombinant DNA. So how do you make recombinant DNA? This is technique number two. Go and refer to the video if you don't remember. But basically, you use restriction enzyme, you cut the DNA and form complementary sequence ends. Uh, you cut a point at the plasmid as well. You use ligase to join it up. And yeah, other than the usual stuff, so this is the origin of replication of plasmid. There's a bacterial promoter. There's a marker gene here. Usually, we also add a human promoter upstream of the target gene to ensure transcription of this gene in the host, so in the human. So you want this gene to not only be replicated in bacteria, but also expressed in the human. So human promoter very important here, yeah, okay? And then we take this allele and we, sorry, we take this plasmid we can make many copies using gene cloning and then we take this plasmid which we have made many copies of and insert it into a vector it could be a virus vector liposome vector or a naked dna okay so what's a vector by the way vector is something a vehicle used to transport something 
from somewhere to somewhere. <laughs> so it's basically to transport our DNA from the fr fr uh, into our target cells. So that's a vector. Uh, inject and spray that virus vector, liposome vector, or naked DNA straight into the host and or into the affected area. And hopefully the cells will be transformed and those cells can function normally. Okay, let's talk about the type of vectors and the good things and the bad things of each one of them. Number one is a virus vector. This is usually using retroviruses, which are non-pathogenic. And retroviruses already naturally insert this viral DNA into the host genome. If you don't remember this, you should go revise chapter 1 as well as chapter 18. Um, anyways, it recognizes specific cells and uses the host machinery to produce its own proteins so if we put our own gene in there and we use the virus to infect so-called infect on the cells that are affected the healthy gene will be randomly incorporated into the human chromosome and that cell may be able to produce the healthy allele healthy normal allele Okay, problems. It may cause side effects or allergies because it is a virus you're putting into a human. Uh, because it is looked at, I mean, the immune system recognizes it as foreign. It might be removed by the immune system. It might trigger the immune system, uh, which destroys the infected cells as well as the viruses. And um, if you do use a non-pathogenic viruses, which you have to, if not, it will cause more disease. You don't want to make things worse. Okay, so if you do use um, non-pathogenic viruses, they are actually not that great at getting to cells. So very few cells receive the allele. And yeah, very few cells. And um, it's kind of a short-term effect because host cells will die after a while. So even if it works, the cells that became healthy already, are transformed already, would die. So you have to repeat the treatment again in order to make those cells work. Other problems. Retrovirus also cause random insertion of genes into host genomes like I mentioned just now. And this is a problem because it could insert its genes within another gene or within a regulatory system sequence and disrupt other processes. It may even activate cancer genes or oncogenes genes and switch off tumor suppressor genes resulting in cancer and um, because it's a viral system it may cause uncontrolled viral replication in the body we don't want that so here's a solution use the adenal associated virus aav aav is a type of virus uh, which does insert genes into the host cell, but it doesn't insert genes into the host genome. So it just remains as a plasmid and it still can be expressed by it. The normal protein can be super expressed, but it's just not inserted. Okay, there's another type of viruses which is less used uh, called lentiviruses. This can be modified to have no uncontrolled viral replication, so um, no problems with this problem here. Alright, you can use this or you can just ditch viruses completely and use a different vector. So yeah, hey by the way, AAV is used in some vaccines for COVID-19. Um, you can read up later on. Anyways, yeah, different kind of vector. So other than virus vectors, here is a more common vector that's used which has less problems. Uh, okay, liposome vectors. Liposome vectors are small spheres of phospholipid, so it's bilayer as well, but it's just like an empty bubble kind of thing. So it's cell. It's basically like a cell membrane with nothing inside. Um, you can put the gene that's so normal dominant allele inside the liposome, and then spray the liposome vectors into the human using aerosol and or deliver it using an inhaler so spray into like the nose or in the airways 
or inhaler. Liposome fuses with host cell surface membrane, obviously because it's the same material, it's by phospholipid. And because it's the same material, it triggers the immune response way less than viruses, causing less immune problems. However, it is not as effective as in insertion of the normal dominant allele as viruses because, well, it is not a virus. It's not a living, not, not a, yeah, it doesn't have the mechanism there. It's just a floating ball of lipid. It's a short-term effect as well, just like the viruses, because the whole cells that have received the dominant allele, if it has worked, would die after a while. So you have to repeat the treatment again. So yeah, that's the bad part about this. The third type of vector, naked DNA. So this is actually no vector, essentially. You're just taking the DNA and you're just injecting it straight in the human being or use a gene gun. So this is a gene gun. Just directly shoot it into the cells. It's very cheap. There's no problems associated with vectors. It does not trigger the immune response at all because it's just genes. But the problem is when you when you directly inject DNA into the bloodstream, it's very easily degraded and gene expression, if the cells take it up, the gene expression is very, very low. So yeah, going back here, okay, again, you obtain normal dominant allele from a healthy person, you identify it using gel antropharsis and gene probe, you use PCR to amplify DNA, you make recombinant DNA. You amplify it using gene cloning, the plasmid, the gene. To amplify plasmid and target gene. And then you take that normal allele, you insert it to one of the vectors we just described. You spread the host. And then you hope the cells that are affected take it up. Express the protein and function, be able to function more normally. Let's look at an example of gene therapy, which is SCID or SCID, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Disorder. A famous case study of this is the bubble boy, which is this tiny little boy, kind of cute. This is one of the most famous pictures. Um, and basically, his immune cells didn't function properly and makes him highly susceptible to infections. And therefore, he has to be kept in a sterile environment at all time, handled with gloves, and stay in this pretty much bubble. It's like the boy is quarantined for his entire life. And you can watch um, how the bubble boy actually inf influenced a lot of research and, you know, touched a lot of people in this YouTube video right here. Kind of short. There's also a movie about him, by the way, but it's highly fictional. Okay, um, so SCID or SCID is actually due to B and T cells unable to make this protein called adenosine deaminase or ADA. ADA. So it ADA ADA. Anyways, um, this is due to a faulty allele coding for the enzyme. This is an enzyme, it's a protein. And because it is a recessive allele, it is an excellent recessive allele, we can use gene therapy to help the child. So what do we do? Now we can remove T lymphocytes and then infect it using retroviruses and this transfers normal allele for ADA enzyme into the, to the cells and then we can reintroduce these cells into the child's body. And this allows the child to have at least some functional B or T cells um, and have some immune system, even though it's not amazing. Of course, this is a, there is problems about this. We talked about gene therapy. Uh, regular transfusions of T cells are needed because T cells will die after a while and you will need to um, do this process again. This is not a permanent cure. It just reduces a lot of symptoms. And, but it, it does allow the baby to live outside the bubble, so that's great. So, um, in a different type of method here, they remove stem cells from the bone marrow and then similarly infected them with retrovirus with the normal alleles and then return the stem cells to the patient, um, hoping that since the stem cells are having the working copy of the gene, the new new T cells and B cells 
will continue to have that normal allele as well because as you know stem cells are pluripotent in the bone marrow and are able to give rise to many many cells while staying alive right like it itself renew as stuff my problem with this method is that it has side effects this is more long term okay but it has side effect because the retrovirus tend to randomly insert alleles into a cell genome uh, disrupting maybe tumor suppressor genes and activating oncogenes resulting in cancer of the bone marrow or cancer of the blood which is leukemia and the solution here is kind of what we already studied just now instead of using retroviruses use adeno associated viruses to transform the stem cells instead and maybe this would allow um, less side effects to occur and maybe be a more effective more long-term solution for skin let's look at another one lca lca stands for labus congenital amaurosis and basically is an autosomal recessive eye disease um, this is when the retina cells die off gradually causing a uh, severe loss of vision as at birth and because it's kind of serious and is also um, due to a autosomal recessive eye disease this al allows us to deliver the nominal normal dominant allele using AAV. The vectors are injected directly into retina and the virus will insert the functional allele into the retina cells so retina cells can make the functional protein and restore vision. This is suitable for treatment again because I said it's caused by recessive allele of a single gene. You only need to get allele into a few cells which is the retina cells um, here in order to obtain some vision as ease of access in the affected area the eye is kind of like the external part of your body it only targets the eye uh, no surgery major surgery is needed here and blindness is a serious thing so if one injection can help that and um, yeah and maybe repeated injections a few times in your lifetime that's kind of worth the risk anyway because it helps you see okay let's look at another example by the way every example is important here they do come out for exams these are required examples for you to know anyways this is gene therapy for cystic fibrosis uh, we have learned cystic fibrosis in chapter 6 in recap i just copied the slides here for easy reference cystic fibrosis is uh, caused by a faulty autosomal recessive allele of the F CFTR gene and basically the CFTR gene codes for transmembrane protein which acts as a chloride channel and without that functioning chloride channel um, mucus is thick and sticky which causes a lot of problems basically reduce gas exchange more infections uh, and inability to remove that nucleus, uh, block reduced digestions, and even reduce fertility. Traditional treatments deals with the symptoms but not the causes. Thick mucus in lungs are soft, well kind of uh, dealt with using physiotherapy, percussion therapy, so basically getting the person to lie down like this and then the parent like hits the back repeatedly in order to loosen the mucus and help the person cough it out. Um, deal, traditional treatments deal with bacterial infections by giving antibiotics and if the person has reduced digestions then more enzyme supplements for you then. However, gene therapy deals with the cause which is the mutation. Um, since it is caused by a recessive allele, you can insert a normal dominant allele for CFTR into lung cells. Uh, usually it's liposomes, usually it's inhaled or sprayed and this really helps the cells to express the normal CFTR protein and therefore no physiotherapy antibiotics needed and this is less consuming than time consuming than other treatments however effects as we mentioned just now are short lived and re treatment needs repeating it is also kind of like expensive and it may have side effects as we discussed just now. But yeah, that's gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. 
Um, factors commonly used are liposomes, number one, and liposomes seem to be pretty effective in this way. Um, it's spread into your nose, is not long lasting. Okay, adenoviruses are also used in this case, uh, AAV. You might have heard it in other slides. It's normal, it's harmless, um, but there is usually side effects due to viral infections and not all cells are able to take up that virus. So yeah, vectors always have their pros and cons. Um, it really depends on the disease and the person as well to see which vector is needs to be used. But yeah, isn't that exciting? We can do gene therapy now with many many other diseases um, as long as they fit those requirements and limitations and the technology is still growing so even right now we are finding new ways new techniques in order to cure diseases um, and fix mutations that's it for me i'll see you next video